Okay. Welcome. Welcome, folks. Um, today, we are going to be talking about a core concept in yoga philosophy, the idea that yoga means union or to yoke. And we hear about these ideas in yoga all the time, but I, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about what do they really mean? I know my first few years in yoga, I kind of had this idea that yoga means union, but I didn't really know what that meant. So I thought it'd be cool to dig into that chat today. And what's interesting to me about these ideas of of union and yoking is that depending on the philosophy that you're looking at of the yoga form, there's different ideas about what union means and what yoking means. So, um, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. One of the lenses we'll look at these ideas through are the lenses of dualist versus non-dualist philosophy. And so we can look at how those different frameworks in yoga interpret the movement towards unity and connection both within ourselves like you know when we talk about body mind spirit and with the world around us like self other universe divine and I'm really looking forward to your insights and experiences and thoughts on, on this and I'm keen to hear a few things if if you're interested in sharing like when you first encountered the idea of yoga being about union or yoga meaning to yoke, um, how you might experience that in your practice. And if you've got some ideas about how you might educate your students about union and yoking, whether that be again, union of body and mind or body, mind, spirit, or yoking or union between self and others or community, humankind, universe, etc. So I have a few thoughts to share up front, but your insights are most valuable in this discussion. So have that in the back of your mind um, if there are some things that you want to share. But first, we'll do a few definitions. So the word yoga is derived from the Sanskrit root yuj, which means to yoke or to unite. And for those of you who might not be familiar with the word yoke, a yoke is a um, a device, a harness, or like a wooden beam that connects animals together to like pull a plow or a wagon. So to yoke is like to harness or connect so that you can use that energy, that, you know, horsepower, ox power for a purpose. So to yoke in yoga it is like symbolizes the the practice and the discipline that we need to bind or connect ourselves to our goals uh, and to a purpose, whether that be physical, mental, spiritual. So that's yoking. Um, union in yoga often refers to the merging of our individual consciousness with universal consciousness. Um, it can also refer to the integration of body, mind, spirit, or the harmony between our inner world and our outer world. So that's a rough idea of what union means. But as I said, there's different ideas about what to yoke and union mean in yoga. And particularly that difference can be seen if we look between the dualist and non-dualist philosophies. So, because there's quite different ideas about what union and yoga mean between those two philosophies. So let's dig into that. So from the dualist perspective, this comes from Samkhya, or it's, you'll sometimes see it spelled Samkhya philosophy. Um, and this is like the philosophy we see in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras where we see the eight limbs of yoga laid out. And this is a dualist system. And what dualist means is it distinguishes between two fundamental realities, purusha, which means consciousness, and prakriti, which means nature or matter. And so you could look at the dualist perspective as um, Seeing union relating to the union of these two separate elements, body and mind or body and spirit. 
And in the Samkhya philosophy union or Samadhi, the eighth limb of yoga, union refers to the process by which we might understand or experience consciousness, Purusha, as distinct from Prakriti, the material world. And so the goal of this philosophy is to achieve liberation, Kaivalya, by recognizing our true nature, the true nature of Purusha, and like disentangling it from the material world of matter. And when they talk about matter, they're talking about uh, the stuff of our bodies. They're also talking about our senses, our feelings, um, which are separate and distinct from consciousness, Purusha. So in simple terms, in the dualist perspective, our bodies and our consciousness or spirit are separate and distinct from one another. That's where the word dualist comes from. And union is achieved by overcoming one to reside in the other. So, and in dualist philosophy, spirit or consciousness is considered superior to matter. So body, senses, feelings, etc. So to yoke in this philosophy could relate to controlling or harnessing the mind. And in Ashtanga yoga, um, which is where vinyasa flow comes from, this involves the dedicated practice of the eight limbs of yoga. So reminding you what those are, the ethics, yamas and niyamas, physical postures, asana, control of the breath, pranayama, withdrawal of the senses, pratyahara, concentration, dharana, meditation, dhyana, and union, samadhi. So in this philosophy, the practice of these eight limbs from ethics to union helps to settle the fluctuations of the mind and ultimately facilitate that understanding of the distinction between purusha, consciousness, and prakriti, matter. I'll give you an example. In meditation, we might yoke or harness our mind to a single point of focus in order to transcend those influences or distractions of prakriti, so body, senses, feelings, so that we can realize the pure consciousness of purusha. So this is the dualist perspective. So the non-dualist perspective, one of the major non-dualist schools is Advaita Vedanta. And they suggest that there's no fundamental distinction between our individual self, what they call Atman, and our universal self, Brahman, so that they're really one and the same. So what we call our individual self is not separate and distinct from universal self. So it's a very different philosophy from the dualist philosophy. So in the non-dualist perspective, union is like the, the realization or the understanding or the experience that our individual self is not separate from ultimate reality, from Brahman. Um, and it's this realization of non-duality that leads to liberation, moksha. Um, so quite different from the dualist philosophy. Um, and in the non-dualist perspective to yoke or yoking might involve the practice of like dissolving the illusion of separation, which we call maya, and ignorance, avidya, so that we can 
remember, realize, experience that remembering of our oneness. And so what does this look like in practice that could include self-inquiry, meditation, study of scriptures? One of the methods of self-inquiry is to ask, like, who am I? To yoke our awareness to our true nature and, and gradually dissolve that illusion of separateness or distinction between individual self and universal consciousness. So two very different perspectives on union and yoking between those two philosophies. Hmm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, because, like I didn't realize that there were these two distinct philosophies in yoga that saw union and yoking and the, and saw that, like the goal of yoga as being so different. And, and to understand that one philosophy of yoga sees the body and consciousness as being separate and sees the body as being lesser, something to overcome the needs of the body and our senses and our feelings and our physical experiences. I think that's useful to understand when we look at how we might have approached the body in the past in yoga as something to mold or break or overcome or that the body is an obstacle to enlightenment and I hadn't understood that for a lot of years in my yoga journey and I hadn't understood that maybe that was in some ways at the root of some of the some of the practices of yoga that weren't translating well to a modern world where we don't want to get injured from yoga. We don't want to go, we don't want our yoga practice to be painful and that we want to embrace the experience of being in our bodies rather than use the body as a springboard to consciousness that we're going to discard. Right. Um, so for me, in my journey, coming to a place where I probably combine dualist and non-dualist frameworks in some random way in my mind, but like being able to see the body as a vehicle for union and as a part of self, as opposed to as an obstacle to the experience of self. Does that make sense? And I think it's just useful yeah. to know that they're about these philosophies, right? Um, and understand that there are these different ways of looking at union and, and yoking and kind of the essence of yoga. So if we think about, you know, when we're comparing these two philosophies, the, the dualist philosophy has a clear distinction between the individual self and the material world. And union is about kind of transcending that duality. Whereas the non-dualists are like the self and the universe are one. Union is realizing that inherent oneness and transcending the perception of dualities, if that makes sense. And so the goals of practice are different. For the dualist, the, the dualist aims for the separation of pure consciousness from material entanglements, like these obstacles of your body and your senses and your feelings. And that's what leads to liberation. Whereas for the non-dualist, they their aim or their goal is the realization that there's no separation to begin with. And, and leading to liberation through the recognition of our true nature as non-different from universal consciousness. How they go about that is different. So for the dualist, this emphasizes structured practice and discipline 
to control the mind, to control the senses, to facilitate the discernment of duality. Like the eight limbs of yoga, we have a structured practice and we apply dedicated effort to that practice. Whereas for the non-dualist, their method is more about direct realization, cultivating the knowledge through practices that kind of reveal the non-dual nature of reality, if that makes sense. So in modern practice, like I said with my own practice, we tend to integrate aspects of both dualist and non-dualist philosophies. So while we're practicing physical postures um, and meditation techniques, which might be more part of the dualist philosophy, we might also be exploring deeper philosophical teachings that align with, with unity, right? And so for many of us, this is kind of about finding a personal balance that enhances your unique journey that that aligns with where you're at in your path and what's going to support your journey in yoga so like as i said in vinyasa flow we kind of use both we use the that disciplined approach of of ashtanga yoga practice which is more on the dualist side to prepare the ground for the realization of non-duality right um, or like <clears throat> body, mind, spirit, union. So in vinyasa flow, and and this is so vinyasa flow where we're borrowing from different places, we're kind of bridging the gap between these philosophical perspectives. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to embrace just one philosophy. Like these are different philosophies that we can we don't have to sign up for a lifetime of dualism or non-dualism, right? We can explore and see what supports us in our practice. I think in my own practice, because I began maybe from much more of a dualist perspective, not even knowing that that was a thing, just thinking that's what yoga is, um, I didn't have an opportunity to to really think about what my own approach might be. And I feel to a certain extent that by not exploring that, I didn't have a chance to look outside myself as much as maybe I would have liked or I could have really benefited from thinking about my yoga practice as being something more than self, something more than me overcoming this body to have this enlightenment. And that feels, if I look back, it feels very self-contained. Whereas when I started exploring non-dualism, that gave me an opportunity to start looking at my yoga practice as being something that didn't have, I have a narrative for this. Um, something that didn't have boundaries between me and others or me and the earth or me and the universe. Like for me, starting to explore non-dualism gave me a chance to see my yoga practice as being something that connected me to others as opposed to something that just connected me to myself. And I, that was really powerful for me because yoga had been very individualistic for me, that was my experience until I started exploring those ideas that that yoga was a way for me to connect with others and with the earth and with all the beings around me and with an idea that I wasn't separate from the universe. Um, and that's just my individual experience. But, I, you know, so I'm interested in your experiences, like how, how does your yoga practice create a sense of union within and how does it help create a sense of union with all that is do you have a sense that of the concept of union in your personal yoga practice like how you might experience union of body mind spirit or union of of 
self and other. Yeah, like it's so hard to, we don't have language for this. Like yoga has language for this that we have to like learn. We don't have a modern language for that experience at yoga glow experience. I remember the first time I had a phone that I could, I'm so old that I could record, like do voice recordings into. This is so embarrassing. I would come out of yoga class. I remember being in Toronto and going to yoga class every day and coming out and recording my deep thoughts. And I highly recommend it because not only will you be able to save your deep thoughts to reflect on later, but it's so funny. Like I, when I listened back to it, I'm like, I sound like I've done drugs. Like I sound, <laughs> why does my voice sound like that? Why am I saying these things? Oh, I just realized that when I exhale and other people inhale and we're all sharing a universal breath and like, these were profound ideas and they, you know, say them, they, they sound really silly, but they are also really profound thoughts of connection, right? That I didn't have in my everyday life. I didn't have those kinds of thoughts or feelings. I had those thoughts and feelings when I practiced yoga in a room full of other people practicing yoga and dropped in and and used the practice, the the harnessed myself to those physical practices of asana and pranayama and concentration um, to have an experience of union with myself and also with the other people in the room. And for me, it was so profound. Like I literally didn't have words. So I said these like drunk girl things into my phone that was that was magic you know I look back at that time in my yoga practice that was a magic part of my journey to start having those realizations and then to go into my yoga studies and go like oh these are things these are things that people when they study yoga like I'm I'm on this path and other people have thought these thoughts and wondered what is a body and what is a mind and how are we connected? And how do I overcome all the distractions of my life in order to find oneness? And, um, you know, I didn't have a narrative for that in my own life. Like I needed yoga to help me understand those feelings I was having. Does that make sense? It really is. I wish I still had them. Like my floaty, you know, floaty thoughts about yoga um that yeah like I my kind of brain doesn't have those thoughts on their own I need to be practicing yoga walking in the forest you know like having for me having a repetitive physical experience helps me drop into that state mm -hmm right? Whether it be asana or walking in the forest or, um, and so for me, that's the yoke that I need to gather my <laughs> resources in order to have an experience of union. Um, and, and that's the magic, right? Like how our physical postures and our breath work and our meditation work together on our bodies and on our minds and on our consciousness in a way that contributes to our experience of union, whether that be union of, of all aspects of self or union of self and the universe, the self and the trees, the self and the, you know, ocean, wherever you happen to be, or self and divine reality, if that's something that you practice or experience. Um, how does it happen? How does physical movement and conscious breath and awareness, how does that work together to give us those experiences? It, it's, we really don't have language for it. Mm -hmm. Like we really, it's really hard to, to put it into a narrative 
mm. to, for someone else to understand. It's like we really have to have the experience. Yeah. And so as a teacher, we can talk talk around the subject, right? Um, but really, it, we have to provide experience so that people can yoke themselves to a practice and move through the the apply dedicated effort or tapas to movement or meditation or yoga nidra or, or whatever the practice is to have that point of focus right so that we eliminate some of those distractions and we can be in that place of oneness and that's i i don't know how other people experience that. Like I I don't even have a narrative for how I experience it. So how do how do I have a narrative for someone else? But I can help give them those tools and guide them on the way and hold space for them and then listen to their yoga high ramblings. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it cool? Isn't it cool when you stop making grocery lists in your mind and being distracted by every sound and thinking about what's going to happen next and just like be in this moment. Like, mm -hmm. isn't it mind blowing? And it, to be able to connect you know, the space between being asleep and being awake, that like floaty space that we all experience. And it's so amazing. And it's so much better. So many other experiences we might have in the day. We just don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Like we go to work and like, why aren't we like, I had the best float this morning. Really cool. And I had these sensations and like, I wasn't thinking a single thing. And, and like, we never talk about it, even though we know everyone's having this really cool experience many days of the week. Sometimes it's the alarm that gets you up and you don't get a float, but like, sometimes think, oh, I'm on a real anti-capitalist thing lately. The last couple of years, I'm noticing how much I've been trained into productivity and things making logical sense and being able to put things into charts and schedules and, and packages and, and I <laughs> feel like that quest for productivity and accomplishment and achievement and capitalizing on experiences has maybe limited or shut down or disinhibited us from valuing these experiences and sharing them. Like, like if I go and tell people, oh, you know, in that space between sleeping and waking and I have like this really, like it was so cruisy and awesome, you're like, so you woke up this morning, like, oh, congratulations. I, why don't we talk about that in everyday right. life? That's part of my disconnection from union that I, I'm really lucky that my job is, is woo woo, that my job is yoga and that I get to talk to cool people like you about uh, these experiences. But then I go out into my outside of yoga life, like talking to the neighbors or going to the shops or running into someone in the fort. I have a very small life. And it's like, aren't you thinking about your connection to like the universe? No, I'm thinking about tomorrow, I've got to get the oil change to the car, about this thing. And I'm like, I worry about all that too. Like my brain's very focused on that stuff too, but like, I wish I could carve out more time in my life and cultivate a way to talk to people about the magic of existence in a way that doesn't drive people away <laughs> so that I could have more 
connection to other people. And so that together mm-hmm. we could have union that's more than the union of people going, whew, hot enough for you, which is lovely. It's lovely, but yeah, that's mm-hmm. the rub though, right? Like that some people... Even if they're having those experiences, you don't need yoga to have an experience of union. Like, do they have anyone to talk to about them, to examine those experiences, to understand what they might mean? And and I feel like our yoga community, one of the great things about our community is it's a place to, to talk about that and to talk about connection and to talk about the magical experiences we might have right before we wake up or when we're on a bike ride or when we're listening to birds or whatever. And that's, I don't want to say giving us meaning because there's always meaning, but it's highlighting meaning in a world that can become overly focused on industry to live a life without magic so what do we need for that magic well in yoga we harness ourselves to a practice whether that be asana or meditation or breath work we harness ourselves to a practice in order to have a connected experience, right? And when we consider how many different paths of yoga there are, how many different yokes that there are, um, but they're all an opportunity to have an experience of unity to have a to have an integrated or a holistic or or a connected experience that can lead us to union and again whether that be the union of individual body mind spirit or an experience of universal connection so that the boundaries between self and other can dissolve a little bit right? That we we can maybe a little bit let go of the hard edges of my territory and your territory and maybe have an experience of, of a shared experience of togetherness without such separation. For a lot of folks, and I'll highlight in particular men in my world, they don't have a lot of people they can talk to about the magical experience they had riding their bike or walking in the forest or doing yoga and maybe don't have a language for that and like don't have anyone to go like, has that ever happened to you before? (laughs) And I'd like the space that I can control is my, is my yoga teaching. Right. And I'd like to find more ways in my teaching to invite people in and invite people to share those experiences and to connect so that they know, like, this is a really cool, like superhuman experience you had. And I've had something similar and, and we can talk about these things and that you're not alone having these experiences, having these questions, wondering, why am I here? Who am I? What am I? Like these big questions that humans have always been asking and that have been drowned out to a certain extent, anti-capitalist rant, (laughs) drowned out by busyness and by, you know, not, not having moments where we can have these kinds of conversations, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So my questions to you are, 
how might you talk to the people in your life about union and about these experiences that you have in yoga? Um, how might you talk to yourself about union and yoking and the, the experiences you have in yoga and the experiences you want to have in yoga and how you might how you might come up with some kind of narrative to talk to your students about that mm -hmm. and to maybe do some educating around what we call yoking what we call union what we call yoga and what kind of experiences students might have through yoga and that those experiences are not exclusive to yoga. Yoga just gives us these tools, like literally the harness of asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana. It gives us the tools that guide us towards this experience. That they might also have in the forest, in the ocean, rocking a baby to sleep, driving in the car, right? Like, like having literally any human experience but yoga gives us these tools and it starts to give us a language not to not to categorize not to explain away not to put in a box but to start to communicate with ourselves and with others the experiences that we're having. Totally. Like, yeah, you don't have to go, you don't have to give them a one hour lecture on dualist versus non-dualist philosophy. It's for us. We like to do that. With your <laughs> students, you know, you can talk about the power of, if I wanted to, my arms to get stronger, I would do push-ups. I would lift weights, right? And I would progressively be able to do that more with dedicated practice. If I want to be able to concentrate, I need to, lift mental weights <laughs> I need to progressively stay for longer periods of time in whatever I'm concentrating on yoga gives us a place to develop those tools I could also develop those tools like knitting or in other ways people concentrate I can't think right now but like and concentration is such a great one to bring up because we are losing the ability to concentrate mm -hmm. because we are fed tiny snippets of information and then we swipe to the next thing and we've got all this stimulation coming in all the time from all these different places. And this is something your students are experiencing. They're feeling it. They're concerned about it. They're seeing it in their, in their kids and the people around them. And so we can go like, you know this thing about where it's getting harder and harder to focus and you like never read a full article anymore, even though you're very interested in the topic. Here's how yoga can help us with that. We can develop concentration. We can develop the ability to stay in a place, to stay in a place of focus, to stay in a place of intention, to stay in a place of mindful awareness, right? That's one of the things that we're strengthening in yoga. We're not just strengthening and stretching our bodies and your students want to know that right they want to know that that's a thing that they can experience in yoga and you might also let them know that being able to concentrate is one of the steps to being able to meditate is one of the steps so dharana concentration leads to dhyana meditation leads to samadhi union yeah. and and that's what the why we're yoking ourselves to this practice to lead us on that journey so we can build those muscles so that we can have an experience right and um yeah your students they chose yoga not another kind of movement class they chose yoga for a reason that they, they're looking for these experiences. And I think our students can benefit even more from yoga when we talk about these experiences and when we talk about these benefits and when we talk about yoga as being more than just a physical practice. And I was talking to someone, sorry, this is a tangent, but I was talking to someone the other day and she was deciding 
whether she was going to study Pilates or yoga. And of course, my answer is why not study both? Why not study things for the rest of your life? But like, what's the difference between yoga and Pilates? Pilates is great. I'm also a Pilates instructor, love the practice. It's, it's a great place to focus on precise movement and strengthening and, and really develop great body awareness. But yoga, yoga is a whole other thing. Like that's, that's a whole other thing. That's yoga gives us that, that physical practice that we benefit so much from, but and then it's so much more. And it gives us, as we've been talking about today, it gives us a practice and it gives us a language to have and to communicate these, these experiences of, of union and of humanity and connection and spirituality and and that's so much more to me so much more and if my concern is if we don't talk about it our yoga classes become just movement classes which is fine it's fine but it could be so much more so it's gonna it's there's a couple of things that that take some practice mm -hmm. um and finding your voice as a teacher is a long journey and and finding out like how how do I get this message across in a way that's relatable um that they can connect with that they might be able to go oh I've thought I've never thought about that before oh yeah that sounds like an experience I've had or that I'm interested in having or it, all that takes practice. And I think it's worth starting that practice now. How am I going to talk about and philosophy? I know for a lot of teachers, they talk about it in terms that whatever that student group can relate to, you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm teaching in the Sunshine Coast, I'm going to talk about surfing. If I'm, you know, like... <sighs> I really make myself laugh in my brain. If I'm talking to accountants. I'm going to talk about spreadsheets because <laughs> spreadsheets are magic. No, but I could, I could do it. I could bring philosophy and spreadsheets together. I feel um, figuring out a way to communicate to people in a way that they can connect to where they're not just going to roll their eyes and go, Oh my God, yoga teachers, granola. Right. But even if they do, they heard your words and they had the experience in class and it might not be today and it might not be next year, but at some point they might go, oh, this is the thing May was talking about. I'm cool. I thought she was a fruitcake. <laughs> so you can't control how they receive it, but it is a good idea to package how you're going to talk to students about it in a way that they are most inclined to be able to hear and then think about. I'm willing to bet there's a gajillion videos on YouTube of people talking about yoga philosophy that you could watch and listen to and, and get tips and ideas from to start to think about how might, how might I language this? And, and will I use Sanskrit or will I use English? And how will I pick out examples and like, how do I fit something into the two or three minutes that I can get students to listen to me before they start wiggling and going, oh, didn't I come here to do yoga? Right? Like all of that is going to take a little bit of practice and, a, and a, you're going to have to figure out what your rhythm is going to be with that. Some of us will be offering more philosophy than others. Some of us won't offer any philosophy, but maybe five years down the track will be like, I really want to start introducing this to my students. So like now's the time to start thinking about how you're going to do that as a teacher. Before you do that as a teacher, uh, this is my final thought. Sorry, I won't keep you any longer. But before you do that as a teacher, as a student, as a practitioner, Maybe really start to think about those experiences of union that you're having in your practice, those experiences of connection and how you might relate personally to some of these philosophies and to how you experience body, mind, spirit, 
individual self, universal self, connection to self, connection to others. Um, these are things to, to take time to consciously think about, right? Um, so I'll leave you I'll with leave that. You. Thank you so much for joining me for this chat. Thank you so much for your contributions. Um, I really appreciate you. Hello to those of you who are listening to the recording. And I look forward to seeing y'all next week.